if that's okay. So sure. I want to welcome, you... yeah, I want to welcome everyone, yeah, uh, to the event, uh, web, uh, webinar event. Um, why do we actually hold this right now? Uh, obviously, crypto is uh, top of mind for everyone. You can see it in the headlines of pretty much every newspaper on a daily basis now, um, either positive or negative. Uh, so here uh, we have created an event that goes from A to Z in regards to um, covering the space. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation by Bobby Hennebury, who has kindly uh, agreed to uh, host, or oh, basically uh, be the moderator for the event. Um, he is a very knowledgeable previous um, uh, crypto miner, yeah, and uh, uh, also a professional investor. Uh, and we will uh, go through what is Bitcoin, what is cryptocurrency, what is the blockchain, uh, all the way to the institutionalization of the asset class, uh, touching on that with uh, our other speakers. So uh, with that, I'm happy to hand over the floor uh, to Bobby. Thank you, Leo. I appreciate it. And I'm going to go ahead and end the poll right now and let you all see here that, you know, we've got a mixed crowd of some people that are really into it and some people that have a basic understanding. And so just want to note that, that there are a lot of people that are uh, new to this and that's totally okay. That's the point of this event is to really kind of help you ask those questions. So whatever those questions are, feel free to, again, drop them in the chat whenever you like. Uh, my name's Bobby Hennebry, as Leo just uh, mentioned, and I really want to express gratitude to Leo, Alex, the whole on-chain team uh, for hosting this, bringing myself, other speakers like James, who's uh, present at the moment. And um, the format is going to be you know, roughly 30 to 45 minute presentations. Uh, there's some that may be a little shorter uh on a range of topics to really help you understand the basics of crypto the custo custody issues the range of financial products that are evolving in this technological platform that is blockchain crypto DeFi, all these different things and any of those you got questions about we're happy to answer at any point in time so i'm going to go ahead and uh ask one other quick question here to warm up the crowd which is this do you own crypto yes or no i'm just curious because that also helps us gauge you know how much you're into it or not right and uh so i'll end this poll in about three seconds for those of you that still want to answer and i will share the results right about now okay sure so most of you uh have invested some haven't there's no pressure to or not. And for those of you that have invested, I'm sure you have some interesting questions and experiences too. So feel free to bring that out uh, through the chat during the call. So with that, I'm gonna get into my slides and we'll get underway here. So one second. All right, so you know, the way I got into this is I started mining at home back in 2016 and I had a traditional investment career, CFA charter holder, portfolio management for high net worth, individuals, family offices all around the world. And I just, I was just really interested in crypto and it took a, a number of years before it clicked for me. I decided to mine, a good friend of mine helped me set it up and that was late 2016. Then it took off and then I started doing a lot of international travels in the Middle East, Central Eurasia, Southeast Asia. And I went to you know, 40 countries the last four years. And as I built relationships and did a bunch of leadership facilitation work, many business networks and CFA societies, financial planning groups started to ask me to explain it. So that's kind of how I've evolved in the ecosystem. And all of us who are in it have different stories. Uh, but I would argue that we all just were fascinated with something about the ideology, the technology, and where it can take the world. Um, so in any case, um, before we hop in, these are my perspectives and opinions on my deck. And uh, there are a number of, of risks and uncertainties and each of us will address them in different ways in this presentation. And so ultimately you got to kind of think about your own capacity and willingness to take risk, uh, which is probably why you're showing up if you're new to this is to understand that, make more sense of this asset class. 
there's a range of opportunities in it. There's a range of risks. And those of us who have been in it for a long time, we've seen a whole roller coaster ride of emotions uh, and our assets for that matter. So I'll start with Bitcoin, as Leo mentioned. I'll get into uh, broader cryptocurrencies, some of these words, proof of work, proof of stake, the different ideologies that are out there to try and help tee those up at a high level, but also help you kind of uh, parse out the diversity of this ecosystem. We'll do a little blockchain example. Leo's going to help me with that, uh, possibly Alex too. And we'll try and make it a little interactive here uh, in this presentation. And again, feel free to drop anything in the chat uh, if you'd like uh, to ask any questions. Okay, this is the easiest distinction that I like to start with whenever I present on this, because there's a conflation of these three terms. There's Bitcoin, crypto, and blockchain, okay? You can think of blockchain as just this platform, this protocol that allows a digital asset to be transferred directly from one person or entity to another, directly, not through a third party, okay? And that blockchain protocol allows any digital assets to go. The first digital asset that really worked uh, in this protocol was Bitcoin, which Satoshi Nakamoto created in a 2008 white paper. We'll get to that in just a minute. And then Bitcoin, some people saw limitations, some people saw opportunities, and then this broader ecosystem of crypto started to evolve on top of the blockchain protocol. And then back in 2017 or 18, when it really got global in a big way, there was a lot of investment in the what else can we use blockchain for? Okay, we'll get into some of those themes in a bit, but just understand in any news report or any, any commentary, are they talking about a pure blockchain application that is not the currencies, or are they talking about blockchain applications that are broad crypto or specifically Bitcoin? Because all the characteristics are in fact different. Um, thank you for the question already in the, in the q and I appreciate that. The cost of safekeeping of crypto is too costly and risky compared to gold and fiat currency. Like to hear your point of view on this. Well, that's an interesting point because, I mean, if you got physical gold in a vault in London or pick a place that keeps it, um, that's pretty costly as well. There's a huge storage expense for physical gold. Also, the shipping expense of physical gold is quite expensive. Whereas technically, if you look at the tip of my pen here, if there was a a cold storage device that held private keys, you could hold billions of dollars po fully portable in crypto. Okay, so now there's risk in that, right? <laughs> you know, and if you lose your private keys or lose your passwords, then that's a cost. There's other custody risks too, and there's some bad actors out there. There's some bad governance problems early on, the Mt. Gox challenge as one issue, but custody is improving. Uh, governance has been improving in the space, insurance, and in a way that's what on-chain on has been at the forefront of in recent years is helping institutional and family office clients be more comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, their gold has a significant cost as well, uh, in my opinion, just in storage. And then there's just the inflation cost of fiat currency, which is quite costly over the course of 10, 20, 30 years, right? Whereas store of values like gold or Bitcoin, for those that believe in it, there's an argument that that is more sound money than fiat, which fiat would erode in value because of inflation. So there's a, there's a couple of comments there. Thank you for sharing that question. Okay, so back to the distinctions. You all can see the distinctions here. And um, go to this next slide. So it's a very diverse ecosystem. And each one of you who's new to this in particular, you're going to want to like simplify it. You're going to want it to be one thing, okay? But it is not one thing, okay? Any of these coins, they are quite diverse. There's libertarian ideology and thought. There's Austrian economist thinking in it. There's cryptography for cryptographically encoding, entrepreneurship. There's smart contracts. There's digital contracts and digital applications. It is super diverse. And that's why the creator of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, said writing a description for this thing for general audiences is bloody hard. There's nothing to relate it to. OK, and, and we naturally want to simple. We want to have a simplifying heuristic. And so I'm asking for each of you uh, listening that are new, really try and expand your mind and your comfort zone because each of them can be multiple things simultaneously, each of the cryptocurrencies that I, I'm talking about, okay? 
So they have hybrid characteristics. Sometimes it's about currency and transaction speed. Okay. Sometimes it's more about store of value with Bitcoin really being the leader in the store of value space, but also at 10 minute block sizes, that's pretty slow transaction speed. Okay. If you're buying a latte at Starbucks. So then other coins started coming about. There are programmable smart contracts, digital applications, and some blockchains are both a currency and they're a programmable platform. Okay, which you have all sorts of different characteristics. You can have personal identification, other forms of ID. Some have characteristics of companies, uh, whereas others have more of a foundation that is granting uh, research uh, dollars in the space. Some are more venture in how they approach things. So, so they can be a coin, they can be a company, they can be many things simultaneously. And so they are new. And so it's hard to relate. And so the more you dig into it, the more you ask, the more you'll learn about this asset class, okay? I see another question coming in here. Uh, also concerns on the tax related to crypto and capital gains, et cetera. Now it depends on which country you're in. Uh, Singapore has been uh, more open, uh, meaning less tax. Uh, in the US, the, the basic thinking according to the 2014 statement by the IRS on virtual currencies, uh, it's pretty easy to find they basically treat it like a stock. Now there's a debate in the community where the community says, no, it's a currency, it's not a stock. Well, it looks like a stock and a security according to regulators in the US. So short-term and long-term gains apply just like trading a stock. Now what's unfortunate about that is if I'm gonna buy Leo a latte, you know, and you know, we're out one morning and I use Bitcoin and there was a gain embedded in that, technically I have to pay a gain on even buying a latte. Okay, so there's a lot of debate and tension in the space and different countries have different rules around it. But most countries by and large, they just tax them normally like capital gains, but other countries it's different rules. Hong Kong also has a mix of rules uh, in, in the space as well. Okay, moving on with some of these uh, slides here. So who is Satoshi Nakamoto? No one knows, it's a one male, one female, a group, a team, no one knows, okay? And that made me concerned at first. And then I realized, you know what? This is fully open source code, it's global. And the person that created Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, did it in the least egocentric way possible and created it in the spirit of what the currency is. It's decentralized. It's not about a single person, okay? And they've managed to keep their... Uh, ID anonymous, okay? For those of you that are interested, the, the, it's 10 or 11 pages, the 2008 uh, white paper, Bitcoin a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It's, it's actually pretty easy to read for being a programmer document. And um, now there's some nerdy stuff in it too, which the mechanical engineer in me likes, but it's interesting. And it outlined the rules and an argument for eliminating the double spend problem. Now, the double spend problem is if I send, you know, Leo some currency dig virtually, who's to say I can't send the same thing to James or to Alex simultaneously, which effectively erodes the value of the currency. Okay. So the white paper made something digital fully scarce, which was a game changer. Okay. Now in the rules of Bitcoin, there's a fixed supply of 21 million coins to date, 18.6 million are in circulation. They've been mined. And the final reward is in another 120 years. There's 10 minute settle time, settlement time. So every 10 minutes, new blocks are released, new coins are issued and transactions across the market can happen in Bitcoin. And there are also these having events every four years roughly, uh, which basically kind of regulates the scarcity. And it basically outlined a whole ramp for the currency to be issued to market with an entrepreneurial incentive. And that entrepreneurial incentive is in the form of mining, which I'll get into in a minute. Now, as I noted, transaction times for Bitcoin are every 10 minutes. So if you look on the right side here, focus on that. If transactions are every 10 minutes, you're not going to wait for a Starbucks, Leo and I, when we go out for a Starbucks for 10 minutes to pay. Okay, that's just crazy, right? But if I'm going to send money across the planet to my cousin in Dubai or whatever, then 10 minutes, that's really good. Okay. 
And so Bitcoin had limitations relative to the payment processors. So one of the reasons it went from Bitcoin to more cryptocurrencies is some people just wanted to be the next Bitcoin, right? But they didn't have the network effect and they weren't better than the, the entrenched player. Others said, you know what? We need to have bigger block sizes. We need to have faster transactions. So other entrepreneurs started building upon the open source code to create different digital currencies that could solve different problems in different economies around the world. So that was also one tailwind to why it really started expanding early on. Uh, thank you for the questions here. Uh, read a lot of news saying crypto and mining is not environmental friendly and consumes huge energy resources. All right, I'll get into that in a bit. Great question. Um, I'm also managing floating information here. Okay, so what are cryptocurrencies? Let's just get a quick academic definition. They're open source digital assets they're as a medium of exchange and they use cryptography to encode the currency. As I noted, they made something digital scarce, no duplication or copying, and control is decentralized through a distributed ledger. So it's not about a central authority, it's really decentralized. And, and all of us, we've, we've been raised in more who's the leader or who's in charge structures in our lives, which are very normal in the human experience, okay, in the scope of history. And in a way, you got to resist that in order to understand crypto because it's intentionally designed to not be centralized. It's designed to be owned by everyone. Okay. And again, that's also what's brilliant about how Satoshi created it is, yeah, there was this name Satoshi. We don't know who Satoshi is. So it's not, it literally was a gift to the people. Here's a white paper, make it work. And, and there were also user groups and blogs earlier on that really made it come together, but, but it's distributed. It's really fascinating. Okay, now what's this mining thing? This, this gets to the electricity question in cost a moment ago. Let's use an analogy. So gold mining, pretty simple to understand. You got a Komatsu or a John Deere backhoe, it digs in dirt, that's CapEx, capital expenditure. And it, it can run if it's got variable expenditures in the form of diesel and people, but mainly diesel, let's say. And then if you're effective at this, you'll get enough gold out of the ground that the gold, the revenue will be worth more than the expenses that's basic business 101, right? Revenue, expenses, you got a profit and you can pay down the debt, you know, on your capital expenditure and, you know, you got a business, okay? Well, in crypto mining, it's the same kind of model, except, and this is what uh, Satoshi kind of enabled was, was an entrepreneurial incentive for people to choose to come into the ecosystem. Okay, so a mining rig in crypto land is this upper left is a, that's a mining rig. The red things are graphics cards and they're like the, the workhorse or the motor that is just trying to solve math problems to find these digital coins, these complex alphanumeric characters that are unique, okay? So they're running 24 seven and that means they're burning electricity, okay? When you burn a lot of electricity, that's the work and the proof for your work from mining, from doing this whole thing and processing transactions is you get cryptocurrency released to you, okay? And if the cryptocurrency is worth more than your marginal cost of electricity, you will rationally do that. Like I said earlier, I came in mining Ethereum, okay? And when I came in in 2016, Ethereum was $10. I got one Ethereum every other day, okay? So that's $5 a day in revenue. And I was spending one to $2 a day in electricity. Okay, now I live in Atlanta, Georgia. It's pretty hot here in the summer. So I'm spending $2 or more in July in electricity, but I'm only spending a dollar in December because it's cooler, right? So that's, but that's in a residence, okay? But that's how the people that were early into this, that's what they were doing. It was like a little arbitrage. So would you spend a dollar or two a day in order to get $5 a day? Yes, that's economically rational. I spent $2,000 on the rig and I held it or I hodled, H-O-D-L, that's the slang for people that hold, it was a typo on a post early on. So I'm a proud hodler. Some of you might refer to that as being a value investor or a long-term holder. Okay, that's a thing. And so anyway, for those of us that held on, the mining paid off big, but then on the opposite side, once everybody came in the network, there was more hash rate, the difficulty went up. So, so there, some of the equations embedded in these currencies regulate the supply and demand to some extent. So they don't just want to create stuff out of the blue, otherwise that would dilute the currency. So at the peak, I was paying $500 over five weeks to get one Ethereum because the whole world got into it 
And so big profit margins attract multiple players and the margins shrink down over time. And so then, you know, crypto went from, or Ethereum in my experience, went from like 1200 down to four or $500. And once it hit that, which was my marginal cost of electricity, it was not rational economically for me to run anymore. So I shut down my rigs. So in mining, those that have the lowest marginal cost of electricity stay in the market. And the miners are doing two things. They're doing the primary market, releasing the currency out, and then secondary market transactions across the network. I saw a question come in. I wanna handle this and I'm also watching the time too. Uh, so it won't carry along too long. Uh, what will happen when Bitcoin reaches its cap rewards, gets halved, and yet prices do not keep up? So uh, the last Bitcoin will be released in 2140, 120 years from now. The last halving, so the initial blocks of Bitcoin were 50 Bitcoin per block. And then after four years, it went to 25 Bitcoin, 12 and a half Bitcoin. So it's, it's assuming the, the system's getting more efficient and more people are entering the market, right? And so the lower cost electricity producers will continue to secure the network with their mining rigs. And it's a bet on if the world adopts it or not. It's just a venture bet. So if the world continues to adopt it and find utility in Bitcoin, then the price will rise. And there will be an economic justification for people to have the CapEx and the variable expenses to prove the transactions, process transactions across the blockchain. Uh, miners have less incentive to keep the system going without miners. The transactions cannot go through. Yeah, so ultimately the system has to be self-sustaining and that's the bet. And so far the bet's working pretty well. It's working way better than any venture bet uh, I've done personally. Um, and, and so this, these, this slide sums up that last question. So mining does two things. Primary market, digging di coins out of digital dirt, and then ultimate, and they also do secondary market transactions simultaneously. But ultimately, the primary market for Bitcoin will go away, and the prices for transacting across the network for using Bitcoin, you know, in twenty one forty when the last one's out, that's a hundred and twenty year ramp to figure out if this thing's going to work or not. Okay, we'll see. But so far, it's working. Okay, thank you, thank you for those questions. Okay, now I'm gonna switch. That was that was that was Bitcoin, crypto broadly, and how mining works, and mining is securing things in the network. Okay. I see a hand raised, but I I don't know where you are. So if you can drop it in the chat, I can see whatever your question might be. I think that was Philip that dropped that in. So there there is a different consensus philosophy, okay? We just covered proof of work, which uses a lot of electricity and there's a lot of expense involved. A secondary consensus mechanism is called proof of stake, okay? And the key question is how do you create consensus across this distributed network without needing to trust someone, right? Because bad actors could come in and steal stuff. So how do you choose to transact across the global network without an intermediary directly from peer to peer with this distributed uh, network, okay? Well, mining is one solution that has worked so far. Okay, and in a way, it, I, I'd like in proof of work mining to uh, Uber, right? Central technological protocol, entrepreneurs with assets, cars, can choose to use a variable expense in fuel to pick me up and drive me over to Leo's house before we go out and grab coffee, right? I'm the asset being d delivered across a network through a central technology protocol, right? Each of the coins is a central technological protocol that entrepreneurs can choose to go into the system and, and operate within in mining. Proof of stake is different in that the coins, instead of being mined you know, through that electricity and computation, there's usually some sort of pre-mine or a, an issuance, an initial coin offering, right? So there's a road show and then people say, I've got this new coin, it's gonna have these characteristics and solve this problem. And we're gonna issue, I don't know, 100 million of them or whatever it is. And we may do it every four years or we may do it all at once. And then people that choose to invest in this ecosystem, the ones that have the bigger stake, they have more money in the system. They have more responsibility to validate transactions across the network. Okay, so proof of stake is if you have a bigger stake, then you have more responsibility for uh, uh, proving transactions across the network. Validators are generally rewarded with a transaction fee as opposed to awards, but in some cases they get rewards. Okay, 
Now, although it uses significantly less electricity, like only 1% in many cases compared to mining, the purists in the Bitcoin community in particular who want fully decentralized control say, whoa, 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 whoa. People that have more money in the system control more of the system. That's a step towards centralization. We don't like that. Well, it's also a step towards using way less electricity. Okay, so I don't know what's the right answer. They're just different consensus mechanisms. And that's one of the reasons there are big political debates in the community about what is the right way to have consensus on any transactions in a cryptocurrency or a blockchain protocol. I see some questions coming in. I wanna address these and be mindful that I need to wrap up in the next uh, 15 minutes. And I will not be taking as many questions afterwards since there have been some uh, given here. And I appreciate everyone's questions. Um, uh, da, da, da. Yeah, we covered the electricity one already. Next question, keep hearing decentralization, but crypto mining is uh, depends on electricity and internet, but the electricity and the internet is centralized. If this uh, two turn off, what's going, okay, how many countries are on the planet? The United Nations recognizes what, like 195, okay? And there's, you know, what you're saying, all these mining rigs around the planet, of which I would argue, let's say only 150 countries have mining rigs in them, okay? But like, I mean, I had a mining rig in my living room. You know, I was in Dubai a month ago and there were some miners there. Like every country pretty much has these, okay? And that's the thing. If one country, if an entire country goes out of electricity, like if all of America goes out of electricity, okay? There are other countries that are having electricity. And if every country on the planet doesn't have electricity, we got bigger problems. Okay, the ledger's still there, but but it's basically there's redundancy built on a global scale for securing the network. Okay, the same with internet, right? I mean, has since the internet has been around, has there been any point in time that the entire internet in every single country has ever has fully been off? Not that I've experienced. But if that happens, everything else is kind of messed up too. Um, so it's a really, that's an interesting question. I've never actually received that, but, but this is why the mining is powerful because it's fully distributed and it's got redundancy built in a global scale. Okay. So coming back to the slide here, just keep in mind two ideologies, proof of work, proof of stake, proof of work uses a lot of electricity, but there's an entrepreneurial incentive that's kind of a floor of value in the currency for creating consensus. Proof of stake is a little more centralized, uses less electricity. They're different models and there are different debates on the trade-offs and merits of those ideologies. And in a way, you've also heard, might have heard this language, they're what are called permissioned and permissionless blockchains. Uh, Bitcoin is permissionless. You don't need permission to join, right? Anybody can go out and buy a rig, download the open source software and start mining, okay? permissioned blockchains, uh, you have to have permission to join. And there could be reasons for that. There, there could be it, not just in a full currency, but there could be some consortium uh, or that's something that has some client information that maybe you want to keep more centralized. So there's a, a spectrum of blockchain uh, permissions out there too. I just show this to kind of step back and just show the global adoption, which in a, in a way touch on the question that was shared a, a moment ago. Um, this is a heat map, a heat map, and Chainalysis is a fabulous resource. You can see in the link on the bottom. For those of you that want to nerd out on data and really follow the flows and trends, check out Chainalysis. They got great charts and data. But crypto is global, okay? So this is adoption around the globe, okay? And to varying degrees of adoption in different countries. Also, another thing that drives adoption that I think I'm in America, so I forgive me. I have an American perspective. I also have a global one. But many Americans, uh, they, we take for granted how rule of law matters, right? And also that's a big strength in Singapore, rule of law matters, right? And rule of law is there for the interest of the people. Whereas on a spectrum across the world, there are certain countries that are all about the central authority, okay? And in those countries where central authority matters most, there is more of an interest for the population uh, for both digital assets and blockchain applications 
to adopt it. I mean, I've been on panel discussions in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. I've been to uh, Jordan. I've been to Egypt. I've been to Cayman Islands. I've been all over South Africa. I've spoken at multiple events all around the world on this. And it's really interesting just seeing the diverse perspectives of both crypto assets and blockchain applications. And then if you step outside of countries, think of any industry. You know, you can think of an industry where central authority is an issue and, you know, maybe that's good or bad. I, I don't know. But think of those applications and that's where blockchain may make more sense. Also, sometimes a lot of people critique the volatility of crypto. Well, sometimes fiat's more volatile. Lebanon, before the August 4th blast last year, uh, their currency was off 80%, 80%, okay? And Uzbekistan, 2017, the SAM was off 50%. There's hyperinflation examples all around the world. Okay, so there's, there's real legitimate uh, situations where people would much rather use crypto, especially in a diversified part of their portfolio. Okay, this is where we're gonna, we're almost to the end. I'm gonna do a quick example with Leo, if he can uh, hop back on at his convenience. But let's just describe briefly an academic definition of, of blockchain. It's public, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer ledger. And transactions, blocks, are valid once added to the chain. They're sequential and they're immutable. Okay, I'm going to do an example, but I'm just giving you the language here. Okay, with Leo's help. Thank you, Leo. Uh, tampering is immediately evident because uh, the, everyone has kind of a copy of the, of the, of the blockchain of the, or of the transaction. And so it's regarded as safe. So we're gonna show that to you. Now, one other bit of safety is, is it's actually hashes that are recorded. It's not like, you know, Leo has this amount of money and Bobby has this amount of money and this is his social security number and all that. What's recorded on the blockchain is what you see on the bottom, these alphanumeric hashes, which are one way, one way cryptographic functions that take data of arbitrary size and put it down to a fixed size in these little tags. And if anything is changed in that, like capital or lowercase, the hash is totally different. So the hash rate, how fast these computers process, is how fast they're processing these alphanumeric strands, but it doesn't disclose your personal information. All right, Leo, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much, Bobby. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for uh, raising your hand to volunteer for this example. <laughs> okay. And... Um, and also while I'm doing this example, I'm gonna, at some point I'm gonna have a poll question pop up. I'm, I may need Alex to help me out with that while I'm doing this, but uh, I'll give you the heads up Alex in just a minute. Um, but Leo, we're gonna do, we're gonna create a coin. Uh, what do you wanna call the coin? Let's call it Leo coin. That sounds like a great <laughs> coin, Leo coin. Why would anyone not invest in Leo coin? All right. so. Uh, I'm going to give you one Leo coin, Leo, and what would, well, let's barter. Like, what would you give me in exchange for a Leo coin? Anything. I mean, it could be money. It could be something else. I mean, what, whatever. Yeah, bottle of wine. Okay. I will take a bottle of wine. What year? What vintage? Uh, 69. <laughs> okay, great. That sounds delightful. Okay, so I will take a bottle of of red wine in exchange for giving you uh, one Leo coin. Do you agree to do that? Yes or no? Agreed. Okay, great. All right, uh, Alex, I, I think I, ha I have control of the poll here too. So I've, I've found it, so I'm gonna, I I've got it. So now everybody who's uh, paying attention right now, listening in, I'm gonna launch this poll question. In this example, did two parties agree to transact with a digital asset? Did I agree to give Leo one Leo coin? Yes or no? Okay, that's all we're doing here. And I appreciate those of you who are answering. This is great. Uh, da, da, da. All right, now I'm gonna close this down in three, two, and one. And I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so of the 12 of you that participated, uh, 10 of you said that that was a valid transaction and two of you said it was not, okay? Which is totally fine. Okay, so what now think of all of you are validators, okay? All of you could be mining rigs, or if this was a proof of stake system, all of you would be voting with you, the weight of your currency, right? Your stake in the currency, right? Well, in this vote, the overwhelming majority said it was legit. So Leo, you are now the proud owner 
of one Leo coin, and I look forward to you shipping me a bottle of that red wine. Okay? Okay. Now, every one of you who participated would write down, you would write, not necessarily, you wouldn't know my intimate kind of account details, but there's, there's a record of, of a hash that A paid B, Bobby paid Leo, one Leo coin, and each of you keeps a hashed copy of that transaction that one digital wallet from another digital wallet, a digital asset was sent, okay? And that is what a distributed ledger is. So now if, if back to one of those earlier questions, what if five of you run out of electricity, right? What if a couple of you, you lose your computer? Well, it's not centralized. There's not one central record or one central le ledger. It's a decentralized ledger that was proved through a mining process, or it could have been a proof of stake process if that was the validation mechanism that we were using. And Leo receives this digital asset. Okay. Now, I'm in the interest of time, I'm not going to do it a second time. Uh, but we, if we did this again, and I let's say I'm the IPO, I'm the initial coin, I'm I'm the issuance, right? And Leo's next week is like, all right, I'll send you another bottle of wine for another Leo coin. Or maybe prices change. And he says, you know what? Um, Leo coin went up in value. So it's only going to be a half a Leo coin, right, that I'm going to use. Or it goes down and I got to spend two. You know, market volatility happens. Prices change. And entrepreneurs and people in the ecosystem adjust, right? And then once Leo has a coin, he can choose to transact with other people on the network of people who choose to interact with Leo coin or not. Okay, so that is a an example of roughly how uh, these consensus mechanisms work and how blockchain works. And even if it wasn't a coin, if it was a, a some other digital asset, medical record, or personal ID, there are other assets that could be transferred across a blockchain or in a distributed ledger. Leo, you have been fabulous. Thank you very much. And I, I honestly look forward to us actually having a real bottle of wine together someday. Okay, <laughs> maybe not sixty nine, but we'll try. <laughs> That's okay. Well, well, depending on where crypto goes, we may be able to do that. <laughs> um, good. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this. I've only got a couple more slides, and then I want to pass the ball uh, to our next speaker, James. I also want to acknowledge there's been some questions here. We write a lot of news. Uh, okay, yeah, you, we've covered that one. Okay, check. And uh, thanks for your question. If you need more details or questions, yeah. And the on-chain team is here to help you as well, uh, both live and afterwards. So they've got a lot of experts that know what they're doing and they're more than happy to answer questions that we can't address in this seminar. Okay. So then we covered Bitcoin, we've covered other kind of other cryptocurrencies. Then again, there were other themes that have emerged from know your customer AML, you know, what if you have different nodes of operators across the network and syndicated loans and regulators could sit on top of it and use blockchain to approve transactions in a more efficient way? People are working on those uh, questions. Uh, smart contract auto execution. So some of these coins have the ability that if, you know, a certain temperature is hit in a certain zip code in the month of January and you're a farmer and you've got an insurance contract, then a certain payment could be made, you know, presuming crops are frozen. That's like an insurance example, okay? There's all sorts of other auto executions you could have in financial markets and other markets. Supply chain, ID, but so anyway, these are some of the other themes I won't spend a lot of time on, but I just wanna address those, that that is what other people saw, and now there's all sorts of entrepreneurs trying to leverage blockchain capabilities beyond the coins to solve other problems that the world needs solved. And then in the last couple of years, there've been new themes, decentralized finance, right? What other financial intermediaries might be too expensive and there are new solutions that blockchain and crypto can solve for. Non-fungible tokens, that's a new one. So that's like a currency with a unit of one. The art examples are out there. So I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go into these, but the other speakers will cover different aspects of these themes in their presentations. But I just wanna tee up just how all of this has flowed over time. Okay, and ultimately there's no pressure to invest and you should only invest what you have capacity to take risk in, what you're willing to take risk in, and what you think is happening in the macro environment in the world or in your local economy, okay? And so even in crypto, it comes down to the same basic financial planning conversation you would have in any other asset class, okay? And whatever's happening in your business, okay? So again, to, to close this up before we move on to our next speaker, 
you know, it all started with Bitcoin, which solved the double spend issue, which is fascinating. And seriously, read that Satoshi Nakamoto white paper. I'm a nerd, but I think it's cool. Okay. And it's only 10 pages. Then other people saw limitations of Bitcoin. Other people saw different applications for Bitcoin. And then these other currencies started coming out that, you know, had different um, process transaction times. Other people wanted more programmability, just like there's there's uh, Java and computer programming. There's C++. There's all these different programming languages that have different capabilities. Well, other people wanted different cryptocurrencies that had embedded languages and programmability that made them more robust for auto execution. Right. So again, these are not any singular thing. They're hard to describe because they're hybrids. They combine all sorts of technologies and ideologies into singular platforms in many cases, which makes them quite robust and fascinating. Not everybody can do it. So there is risk out there. Some of them fail. There's some other challenges in the space. It's just like general venture investing too. But this is venture investing on a venture ecosystem that's new. And then again, there are these other blockchain examples that are not currency based that people are looking to leverage blockchain technology in okay so that's a lot to cover i really appreciate everybody listening and i really appreciate the on-chain team uh, for hosting and i'm going to switch over to a, a moderator role but before i do uh, are there any other questions uh, i can take one more question before we need to transition to the next speaker here Okay, I don't see anything coming up, so I think we're in good shape. I want to thank everybody uh, for listening in to my part. Thank you very much, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. And I think next up we have James. Leo, do you have anything to add in the interim, or can we hop over to James here? Nope. Looks like we're good. Uh, I think that that is uh, very comprehensive, and thank you very much, uh, Bobby, uh, for that. Um, yep. I learned a great deal as well, and so I hope other participants also did. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, over to James. 